we don't really have any experience with it, which I, again, I love that there's more conversation now. There's books, there's groups, you know, there's even mm-hmm. podcasts that, and my podcasts for the longest time were um, talking to women in, in midlife. And so just, I, I love that we're having this awakening so that, and even people that are listening to this conversation, they're not going to be surprised when they turn 35 and or a little older and start realizing things are changing for them. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, I remember I heard this podcast by Andrea Owen. <laughs> this is your Kick-Ass Life podcast, episode number 355. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. I am excited because a couple of things. It's September as I am recording this introduction, and that also means it is the month of my daughter's birthday. She turned 11 a handful of days ago, and it's also the 10-year anniversary of your kick-ass life. 10 years ago in September, it was around the middle of the month, I think it was maybe a week after my daughter's birthday, that I sent out my very first email to people who had subscribed to my previous blog. That blog was called Live Your Ideal Life, and I chuckle at that name because it is so life coachy, (laughs) but it's what I had chosen at the time. And I had switched everything over to yourkickasslife.com, and I had accumulated a couple of hundred subscribers. Maybe it was only about 150, I can't remember. But I sent out my first email, and I just was so damn excited to write to everyone about how to live their most kick-ass life. This was before I had decided to write a book. It was actually right before I got sober even, and it was before I started the podcast. And the 10 years, it's been one of those things where, like a lot of things, it has flown by and it has also slogged by (laughs) at times. And I know a lot of people do big hooplas and things like that for – big milestones like that, anniversaries for their business or you know birthdays for their life or sobriety things. And I do like to do those, but to be honest with you, it kind of snuck up on me. It completely crept up on me. I have been head down finishing this book. I'm on my third book, for those of you that don't know. It is yet to be named uh, because the name that I wanted it to have – the editor, my editor over at Penguin Random House, and it still blows me away that I'm, I'm writing a book with Penguin Random House, but she didn't love the title. And I wasn't completely married to it. Not like I was married to How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, but I wasn't completely married to it. We are brainstorming new titles, and I can't wait to tell you more about that whole process because I wanted this really bold title Anyway, I don't want to say too much because I get really excited and I I can't tell you too much at the moment. But in a nutshell, this book is about personal development. Big surprise. But it also comes from a little bit of a feminist angle. Basically, what happened was I wrote How to Stop Feeling Like Shit. I started thinking about it, talking to a lot of women, doing a lot of interviews, talking about these behaviors. Also had my own huge reckoning around 2016, 2017. You know, the Me Too movement happened. That woke a a lot of us up and had us do some deep thinking and deep healing. And I came to the conclusion that I can't talk about personal development anymore without talking about what I feel is the root of the problem. I am obsessed with getting to the root of the problem. I want to know what it is so we can find a solution. That's what brought me to do shame work when I was talking about the inner critic so much. But in this case, the root of the problem has a lot to do with our culture and how we are raised as women. We are brought up to be fundamentally insecure because we like to put women in a box. Patriarchy hurts everyone, not just women. But this particular book is for women, about women, and it has made me really nervous to write at times because I am going to 
maybe, I mean, I can't imagine that I would offend anyone. Like, <laughs> but it's definitely going to polarize me as an author because I am taking a stance and I, I couldn't not do that when that's what I encourage all of you to do. So that's what I've been doing. I have about six or seven weeks left until I have to turn in my manuscript. I cannot wait for this thing to be out to you. Fall 2021 is when it will officially be for sale. Today, I have a conversation about shit that matters with unqualified people with my lead coach, Ms. Liz Applegate. And I want you all to get to know Liz a little bit more. She has a big role over here. She is one of my coaches, and I just adore this woman. She is a phenomenal coach and a phenomenal woman. And I thought maybe we would do a vulnerable episode. I had her on a few months ago, and I will drop that link in the show notes. Today, we're talking about aging, we're talking a little bit about perimenopause, and we're also talking about depression and medication and what that might look like. So her bio is over in the show notes. You can read more about her as well as grab the link to the previous episode that she was on. And I just have one more announcement. I am going to send out an email that is going to have uh, an opportunity for you to give me some feedback about the show. It's going to take you like less than 30 seconds. Like it's it's going to be unless you want to reply and give us more feedback. I'm we're completely open to that and thankful that you do. But it's really going to be one of those, "Hey, which one of these do you want on the podcast?" and you're going to have three choices to click on and that's it. Like that that's literally it. So if you are not a subscriber to my emails, it's super easy to become one. You just have to text the word kick ass, make it all one word to 33777. That's text the word kick ass to 33777. You'll also get a really great ebook and audio if you want to dive into that all about the inner critic. But that will put you on my subscriber list. I send out some pretty great emails about every week or so. And very soon you will get that email where you can help us with feedback. I truly, truly appreciate your time to make the show even better. All right, so that's it with the announcements. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I have nothing else to say except to bring you this conversation with Liz. Liz, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to have this conversation with you. These are some of my favorite podcast episodes, the ones where I get to bring my my friends on and have conversations about shit that matters with unqualified people. <laughs> These are my favorite too. I love listening to them. So I'm so excited to to have an unqualified conversation with you. Yeah. And, and we're going to, ha- we're going to have two kind of separate topics that are, I guess they're they're not really related, but you and I were talking about what we could bring to this unqualified person conversation. And we are going to talk about depression and antidepressants as well as perimenopause, yeah. which I guess they could be they related. They could be very easily, yes. yes. Now that I say it out loud. <laughs> oh, middle age. Yes. Okay. Well, let's start with, with depression and antidepressants. So this is actually something, this will be a first time conversation for you and I, because I don't, I don't know your history with this mm-hmm. and I don't think you know mine. And I've actually, you know, for those people listening, I've had a conversation with Kate Anthony, another one of these episodes where we talked about our history with depression and anxiety. I'll drop that link in the show notes. But that was a good year ago. And since COVID, things change. (laughs) Just a little. with mental health. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's what we're going to talk about today. So why don't you start? Tell me your history with your mental health. (laughs) Oh, well, we don't have the full time for that, but here, I'll start. (laughs) How much time you got? Yeah, right. Um, So I will say that I've always known that depression runs in my family. Um, It's, you know, nothing we really talked about. It's just sort of a known fact. Um, I went, my first time I went on antidepressants was probably about 20 years ago. And I was married to my first husband and my marriage was really spiraling downward pretty quickly. And I honestly thought this was my, my, this was my way of thinking back then that if I could find medication that could make me not so sensitive, 
because that was what I was being told I was. And yes, yes. I remember you have told me this part yeah. of the story. Okay, so I, continue. Yeah, so I really just thought, okay, if I take medication to make me not so sensitive, to make me just a little more even keeled or however you want to put it, mm -hmm. um, that it would help my marriage. And so I, so was he telling you that you were too sensitive? And oh yeah. Too sensitive to, ev okay. to everything to, right. Yeah. To, you know, and it was funny because it was always like one side of the spectrum or the other too loud, too quiet, too bossy, too timid, you know, it's just too intense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Too intense. Yeah. It just was sort of a, okay. So I just thought I'm going to take medication to kind of find that middle ground because obviously I'm just too much, whatever it is, it's too much. Um, so I ended up being put on <laughs> a shit ton. I ended up on antidepressants, um, anti-anxiety, as well as ADT, ADD medication. Mm -hmm. So those three things I was on. Isn't ADT a pesticide? <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't okay. on that. <laughs> It's not on that, that one in. Yeah, no, ADD. Um, so I was on those three, and I actually became like a walking zombie. Um, so I was very middle of the road, I got to say. Like, I was very, like, compliant, um, but I was, I was numb. I was checked out. And it hit me that I saw a commercial that, I, that registered that if I would have seen that commercial without this medication, I would have teared up and I would have felt like something in my heart just like clench. And I realized that I didn't feel that. And that was a turning point for me. It was like, fuck this. I'm not even myself anymore. And yeah, I'm just not doing it. So. Oh, so it was like an emotional commercial yeah. that you didn't feel anything. I gotcha. Yeah, okay. it was something that I knew that something registered in my brain that was like, if I were watching this commercial and not on this medication, I would have really like felt this, you know, and I would have teared mm -hmm. up and it was just so sweet. And, you know, just me being who I was, knew how my reaction should be. But when I realized that was not how it was, it was like, oh. Like I'm, I'm just not even myself anymore. And so that was, you. yeah. So that was the first time. Um, and then I have decided, well, <laughs> it took me a long time to decide. I'll be totally honest because of that experience. But in July, just a couple months ago, um, I decided to go back on antidepressants because of everything that was happening and I have to say, in hindsight, I really probably should have been on it at least since 2016, if not, if not sooner or earlier than mm -hmm. that. So, well, I'm curious, like, what were your symptoms even in 2016 <clears throat> and or that led to you making the decision in July where you decided to go back on them? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question because I feel like, um, I, f I feel like every, you know, if I talk about my symptoms, they, they weren't exactly like what I feel like people think of as being like, I have depression, you know, because here I have, you know, I have a business, I have clients, I'm busy, I'm, you know, I'm functioning. And, but there was a lot of just kind of sadness and I couldn't, I could fake it and I had a lot to mm. be grateful for. But I just didn't feel it. I'm a feeler. So I just wasn't feeling it. And I was finding myself, um, one of the things that stands out to me is unmotivation to, to like pick up and clean my house, which I'm going to be honest, like I hate that shit anyway, but I know that I should do it, right? <laughs> but when I look around my office and I see like piles and piles and I'm like, oh, crap, like something, like that was probably the first physical thing I saw. And that's where it kind of shows up in me as kind of an unmotivation. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, I'm a feeler. So with everything going on and just even when I was limiting social media, not watching news, all these things that I know I need to take care of myself, when I'm still feeling that heaviness, then I just really started thinking, you know, and especially, especially in July, I was like, if not this year, then when? I mean, honestly, if 2020 right. hasn't given me permission to seek <laughs> mental health help, I'm not sure when the hell, you know, I would have permission. So it was really, it was interesting because 
I feel like if I, I, I don't even feel like, I've had friends say, I've been thinking about going on antidepressants and I'm like, oh my gosh, you really should. I mean, it's medication. It'll be so helpful. You know, like why, you shouldn't feel bad about it at all. But then when it came to myself, I was, I was really beating myself up for it. I felt like I should be stronger. I should be better. I should be able to handle mm-hmm. all this stuff. Yeah. Um, Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash noise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash noise to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash noise. Fast forward to the end of 2024 and think about your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If you want to learn a new language, you absolutely should get Babbel. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Now it's so easy to speak simple conversation phrases with the guy that takes care of my lawn without having to consult language apps. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash noise. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash noise, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash noise. Rules and restrictions may apply. And I, I wonder too if you might have been comparing where you're at now to your previous situation mm-hmm. where you were in a difficult marriage and and kind of thinking to yourself, and I'm making this up, tell me where I'm wrong, but like thinking to yourself, oh, that was more of a noble reason to get on antidepressants. You're exactly right. Because yeah, yeah I mean it was 2020 is hard. Yeah. It it was hard, but it wasn't I mean it's hard, but yeah, just in comparison to, I was thinking, well, it's not that hard. You know, it's not as hard as right. that was. So that was a big mm-hmm. factor too. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and and one of one of the reasons I wanted to come on and have this particular conversation, even though it's a conversation I've I've had on another episode, is that and at least it was for me. I was, and, and I, I was thinking like, are there people out there who have myths around what depression looks like? Because I did. Mm-hmm. I I think that I, you know, and in my conversation I had with Kate, I mentioned that I had watched my father struggle with depression for most of his life. You know, obviously I only met him when I was born, but, yeah. but his depression, you know, he was for the most part high functioning. Um, there were times in his life where he wasn't. And then especially towards the end, you know, when he was much older, it, it got more and more difficult for him. And so I think that I compared my own life to his and also thinking about people with pretty severe depression when people would ask me like have you ever you know struggled with depression I would always say no mm-hmm. and and feel really lucky that I had that I had you know in a way dodged that given that I did inherit the anxiety that he also had but um I never really felt depressed and so what was interesting is that I got a new therapist in I don't remember when I started working with her it was maybe May and from the 
heavy advice of my closest friends. (laughs) (laughs) Because I was like, why do I need a therapist when I have you guys? Right. <laughs> and why, my best friend Amy Smith is like, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to lay your burdens down on someone where you don't have to feel like you have to reciprocate the relationship? And I had that had never dawned on me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's true. You, you'd think that I would, I would have thought of that. And I also, I've been through a lot of therapists over the last few years, just really not feeling like I, I found the right match. And it can be exhausting, oh, yeah. right? To, like just to tell your story again, and here's my whole family history, and here's why I'm here. And I decided to ask for a referral from a therapist that I know, and and I didn't want to hire her because she specializes in adolescence. But I, I said to her, who are the therapists therapist? Like <laughs> I need, I just was really honest and it, it made me feel a little bit elitist, but I, I said, I need someone exceptional because I do this for a living. Right. I have the ability to bullshit and kind of rely on my own self-awareness to say, I already know what my problems are. I don't really need this. And also I need somebody to do really deep somatic mm-hmm. trauma therapy. Yeah. That's what I knew that I needed. And I was terrified to do it. I had done some EMDR, which had been helpful, but I, I had to kind of realize like, I think I got out a little bit too early. Mm-hmm. I think I hadn't, I hadn't really covered everything. So I found someone amazing. She is exceptional. She has like 25 years experience. She specializes in energy work, wow. specializes. Yeah. No, I'm not drunk. <laughs> Counted a little bit, a little bit tipsy. No. But I... Have, I'm learning so much from her and she is pointing out some blind spots that I didn't even realize I had. Anyway, all of this to say, one of the things was she was asking me all these questions. It was within the first couple of, of sessions I had with her. And I was talking to her about burnout and that I had, had been feeling like I've been burned out for a couple of years. And you know, COVID has just exasperated mm-hmm. it. We've had some real big difficulties over here. And she said, we started talking about depression and and I said I I don't feel worthless like mm-hmm. I know that if if I was gone people would be sad I feel like my life has purpose I don't have a problem getting out of bed in the morning and she's looking at me and she's like that's not always what depression right. looks like like that's that's far over on the spectrum mm-hmm. and that is some people's realities but she said, Google high functioning depression. And I didn't want to. Like I was like, no. Right. Because <laughs> so, I knew yeah. what was gonna happen. And I got off the phone with her and I Googled it and I was crying and I went and talked to my husband about it. And 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 she said, she's like, I wouldn't be surprised if your burnout, if your long-term burnout has led to this, because long-term burnout can, you know, unchecked and untreated can cause depression. Mm. So that's where I ended up. And for me, my symptoms were total lack of motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, my anxiety also had gone through the roof in March, but that was, you know, yeah. to be <laughs> happened, I think, right. to most of exactly. us. Exactly. Yeah. Uncertainty. But my anxiety was back to the way it was at its worst, where I was g- having just the spiraling thoughts of complete doom, doomsday type of stuff, which I know is common. And um, I really had to just kind of surrender to it. And then I had the conversation with her and my doctor about um, going on medication. And I was nervous, you know, and um, I've had that experience that you had with with anti-anxiety meds, you know, just feeling like the way I describe it is I feel like I lost my Andrea-ness. Like I just like the flat affect felt like nothing really phased me. And, um, but that wasn't the right medication for me. So long story short, I am also back on, on, um, a medication and it's actually helping. I actually think I need to up the dosage Mm -hmm. a little bit Mm -hmm. and I feel, I feel better. Like I feel I'm not ready to take on the world. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Give it time. Yeah. Right. But one of the other things I want to mention too that I found interesting that my therapist mentioned is she said, which which brings me to the maybe the topic of middle age, is she said that a lot of her patients get to be around, you know, in their 40s and they have what she calls, I don't know if it's a term that she coined or if it's, you know, 
a therapist thing, abandonment depression. Mm. So it's when you have the realization of what happened either in your childhood and or in your romantic relationships, and you are coming to terms with how disappointed that you are in how people have not showed up for you, how people have not loved you. Basically, wow. abandonment. And everyone yeah. struggles with abandonment in their lives. And I found that really interesting. And, you know, walking into this trauma therapy with her and really digging into my family of origin stuff and my former marriage and everything, that that abandonment depression thing really rang true. Yeah, I can definitely, when you said that, I was thinking, I think my eyes just got four times. I was like, oh my gosh, that's kind of mind blowing actually when I think about it, knowing. So I'm, I'm actually 54. So I've gone through my forties, but just knowing like that time, like that, that 10 years was pretty crazy. <laughs> 40 to 50. You mean in your forties? Yes. It was just, yeah. it was a lot of that. It was a lot of realization of who I was um, things that I could never change. Um, you know, just a lot of that you're coming. I feel like you're coming home to yourself, but you're kind of coming home to yourself without any illusions. You're, you've kind of, you strip all those and it's just like you're mm -hmm. bare and you're, and you're thinking, Oh, well, okay, here we go. And there are a lot of, um, a like, I just love that term actually i can just see that so well in my own life and maybe even like how we've abandoned ourselves mm -hmm. in in many ways and you know i also want to say cuz i know i have a, a lot a big younger listenership as well as women in middle age and beyond and i i think it's really amazing the amount of younger millennial and gen z women that are becoming self aware yeah <laughs> my mind how young these women are who are who are taking responsibility for their lives and wanting to better themselves because when I was in my 20s I sure as shit didn't care exactly <laughs> that was the furthest thing from my mind it was like right. yeah no I am amazed I applaud them I think it's amazing it is amazing it really is and yeah. it it gives me hope I don't want to take a soft track but just thinking of women and women women's empowerment and to see these younger women and how they're uh, yeah, it's just, it's inspiring, actually. And I, it is. Yeah, it it's gives me great. a lot of Are you familiar with that Brene Brown quote where she talks about middle age? Oh, yeah. And it's something, yeah, something to the oh, yeah. effect of like, middle age is like when life takes you by the shoulders mm -hmm. and shakes the shit out of you and says, we're not fucking around right. anymore. <laughs> I yes. feel that yes. in my bones. <laughs> Same I here. have had a hard time turning, I had a hard time turning 45, mm -hmm. partly because it was April and COVID. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it, it was like officially turning the corner in like you're officially middle age. You can't say that you're in your early right. 40s anymore. More. Like you're, you're, you've turned the corner into looking at your fifties and I, I by no means think that I'm old or decrepit or anything like that. But there is a real thing about mm -hmm. middle age. And I think what also helped me, and this was part of, I think my depression is grieving the loss of my youth. Right. Not just like that. I'm not young and fun and flirty anymore, but just like exactly what you said, like what's done is done. Mm -hmm. like you can't go back and relive that decade or that moment in your life or when your kids were little and change things or when your relationship was new or when you left your marriage. Like, like I, it's, it's obvious that we know that from like a practical standpoint, but I think that like it really sinks in. At least it that does. was my experience. No, it's, it was mine too. And I remember people just saying, oh, it's just an age. Your number is just an age. And I was thinking, well, and I'm like, fuck all exactly. the way off of that. Like, <laughs> exactly. Of course it is. Of course and it is. we and can hold both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're 35. So let me know in 10 years how you feel. <laughs> so, right. right. And it just, it just is. And it just, um, there, there is just this place of, yeah, like you said, it's just you kind of realize you can't go back. And for me, my kids at, at 45, my kids were already graduating high school and, you know, going off to college. And so I had the added like whole empty nest thing piled on. And it was something that I <laughs> was really surprised at because I thought I would be one of those moms that would be like, woohoo, it's time to party. You know, like the kids are flying mm -hmm. the nest. And um, I didn't want to have anything to do with party. <laughs> 
I wanted to just cry. <laughs> so oh, yeah. yeah, it was a, uh, it was very, all of that all came together at the same time. And really and honestly, you know, to go back to mental health, I was seeing a, a counselor at that time. And I actually was really glad that I was because I felt like that was something that really helped me um, just kind of process everything and, and have that open space to, to share my feelings without feeling like I was going to be judged for it or anything like that. So I was glad that I had that support at that time. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that I've learned about aging and talking about aging, especially with women or, you know, people who identify as women, because I think it's a little, you know, men have their, their burdens for sure. And I think it's tricky and complicated for women because our youth is and beauty, you know, we're a youth and beauty obsessed culture and it's our currency and in many ways our only currency. So when it starts to disappear Mm -hmm. and I see women having these conversations, especially online, so it never fails. So I'm in this really large Facebook group and it's for women in their forties. And about once a month, there is a conversation. There's a thread either about Botox Mm -hmm. or, you know, hair, getting your hair done or some kind of anti-aging or like neck cream, like right. some, some kind of anti-aging conversation. And it never fails. There's one or two women in there who say something to the effect of, and they're, they're trying to be empowering and they're saying, you know, aging is a gift only given to few mm-hmm. um, or, or not to everybody and we should embrace aging. And, and it's, and I, I understand the sentiment right. and I can get on board with it. Like, I'm like, yes, I, I feel you. And I really have had to accept that we have to give people the dignity of their own journey. Mm-hmm. And I have especially learned this lesson as I've, as I've been aging because I thought I was going to be the person who totally embraced it and was like, yes, mm-hmm. bring on the crow's feet, <laughs> bring on the gray hair. I have earned this. <laughs> yeah. I am a wise woman. I can age gracefully or whatever the hell that means. And I am having a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, right. wait a minute. I should have this in the bag, right? And I don't. And I beat myself up for it for a little while. And then finally, I was just like, you know what? This is what it looks like for me. I'm not a perfect person. I, gr- I also have grown up in a culture that has told me I am irrelevant right. as a 40-something woman, mm-hmm. um, that I you know, need to do everything possible to hold on to our youth. And I'm having a hard time. Yeah. So let me get the neck cream or talk about Botox. And it's so complicated and it's it this is so just enmeshed with patriarchy and 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 everything it's like we're damned if we, we do and we're damned if we exactly. don't so yeah anyway yeah i'm on a soapbox <laughs> but i just want to say like no. give people the dignity of their right. own journey well who said that aging gracefully can't involve neck cream and botox if you want it i mean it doesn't have i mean to all be. the commercials <laughs> are, are, they're selling that when they tell us to age gracefully right i mean they're not saying don't buy this, don't buy this. neck cream right exactly <laughs> It's hard to find a great mentor who can help me level up. My dream mentor, Shonda Rhimes. So I was really excited when I heard she has a class on Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best. Masterclass is the only streaming platform where you can learn and grow with over 200 plus of the world's best. For just $10 a month, an annual membership with Masterclass gets you unlimited access to every instructor. And you can access Masterclass on your phone, computer, smart TV, or even in audio mode. I'm always looking for ways to be a better writer, so I took Shonda Rhimes' screenwriting class. It helped me gain concrete technical advice, including structuring, the writing process, and with shows under her belt like Grey's Anatomy and Bridgerton, it was so helpful. Plus, every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Don't wait another moment to start your learning journey with Masterclass. Right now, our listeners get an additional 15% off any annual membership at masterclass.com slash Andrea. That's 15% off at masterclass.com slash Andrea. Masterclass.com slash Andrea. 
I have definitely been in that place where my paycheck ran out before the next one got here. Life doesn't happen bi-weekly, so why should payday? The money you earn can be in your hands today with Earnin. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work, up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck, then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. You can use Earnin to pay for a girl's night out, a last minute gift for a loved one, or even summer camp for the kids. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E A R. N-I-N in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in noise under podcast when you sign up. It really, really helps the show. Noise under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. right but i think it's yeah i mean for some people if they want to do that great um but it's every but and i think that that's just i don't know just human beings in general we like to like put things in boxes you're either this or that and then you're not you know it's there's a lot of gray so to, you yeah, can be both there, yes. there's a lot of no gray to talk about yeah exactly <laughs> there is a lot of gray but that's not what i meant so uh-huh. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's I think it's super complicated. I've been really transparent. Uh at least I hope that I have been with my listeners about the aging process and I even talked to my friend Kate about seriously considering growing out my gray hair. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny my friends when I tell them that. I even recently told a good friend of mine who is super into women's empowerment. I thought she was going to be like, right. "Yes, do it." <laughs> She wasn't. <laughs> and it's so funny. She, I, I said to her, I said, you would think that I was telling you all that I was going to go move to the Middle East <laughs> and join ISIS. Like what? Right. I'm just talking about growing out my hair. They, they are that shocked and trying to talk me out of it. But it's okay. So totally switching gears. Well, maybe not totally switching gears, but also I just got done having my period and it was, I'm down to 23 days apart now. Mm-hmm. What the actual fuck? <laughs> 23 days. Like I I barely even catch a breath. So I know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) I got your number and I asked my doctor about it and she was like, and I'm like, is this what's going on? And she was like, if you haven't skipped one yet, you know, it's just kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, basically call me when either they're super far apart or you totally skip a period Mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll check your hormones. Yeah, perimenopause. Just, let's just throw that in there in the mix too, you know. And, and so, peri- so for people that don't know what that that is, because my husband asked me, mm-hmm. he's like, "What is it like? Like <laughs> mini menopause? Like I'm like valid question. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's the isn't it like the the length of time or the the area? I don't want to say period because it's yeah, kind of confusing. Exactly. Like the period of time. <laughs> And menopause is considered when you don't have a period for twelve consecutive months. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. And so perimenopause is the time before that where you have a lot of, where some women have mm-hmm. yucky symptoms. Right. Well, it's when, you're, it's when your hormones are fluctuating, you know, and it's, um, it can actually start as early as in your 30s. Uh, for me, that's when it started showing up. I didn't know it at the time. That term perimenopause, it didn't even come around until the 90s. So we're not. Oh, really? Yeah. That was not a oh, term. Oh, wow. Because God forbid, like anyone oh. study it or talk oh, about yeah. it. Oh, yeah. No, we don't do that. <laughs> Why would we do that? So, yeah. So it's, it's a fairly, when you think about it, it's a fairly new term. A lot of doctors, you know, if, they're, if they've been out of school for a while or didn't really focus in on women's health, then it's something they're unfamiliar with. But really, it's just a phase in time exactly like puberty. But what's interesting to me is, like if we, I don't have a daughter, I only have sons, but if I had a daughter and she was going through puberty, I would be researching this and how can I help her and how can I be supportive? Mm -hmm. And I'd be talking to other moms and, you know, but when we go through this 
time in our life of perimenopause and menopause, it's, it's kind of hush hush, you know, I feel like it's becoming more and more open and, you know, there's more conversations around it. But it still is sort of this like, oh, we don't want to talk about that. You know, it's like, we don't want to go there. <laughs> so it's, it's just a time in your life when you're, you know, you have this time when you're your hormones are like prime to have children and then you're kind of transitioning out of that. And it's, it's just a normal time in life. It it can suck. I'm not going to lie, but it is, it's just a normal time in our lives as women. And it can vary by woman just like, Oh yeah. Like premenstrual symptoms and Mm -hmm. periods themselves, right? right? Like some women, it's kind of a breeze. Yeah, some women go through it, never have a problem, no hot flashes, no, you know, I mean, they don't really notice any, any changes. And then some women, it can be totally the opposite of that. And like I said, I think it happens to some women earlier, because it can actually be up to 15 years, I've read before you actually go through menopause. And so when you look at the average, which I don't even remember what the average is, but I mean, let's just say 51, 52. Well, 15 years from the back, that's in your 30s. Yeah, my doctor said the average age is 50. Okay, so that's 35. So you're telling me that sometimes like the whole process takes that many years? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but here's what probably, you know, I mean, who knows? You could have been experienced, you know, going through it. You just weren't having the periods like you're having now, which from what, again, not an expert, but from what I've learned and and everything, that's sort of like, that's when people first start getting a clue. It's like when their periods turn irregular or, you know, yeah. in whatever way, flow. Time. Some kind of, from what I have heard and just by like, I think my Google searches is that it, when you experience symptoms that are not normal. Right. So my periods have always been like clockwork, 28 days apart. And they slowly started to get shorter and shorter. Like I had a couple that were 26 days Mm -hmm. apart and then 25 days and now I'm down to 23. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't like that at all. No. (laughs) But but I am lucky that I don't have really heavy periods. Mm -hmm. It's only a handful of days. So it's, so okay, wait a minute. Let me back over a second because you mentioned in one of our conversations that you wrote a book. Well, I've written a chapter in a book, not a whole You wrote a chapter. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so what was that about? I, I haven't read it, and I don't know much about this. So it's called Mokita. It's a word that basically means the elephant in the room. And I oh, I got gotcha. you. Right? Okay, so not it's, to be confused with Nokia, no, which is the not phone Nokia. company. <laughs> Mokita. <laughs> and yeah, so and I can't remember where the country is from, but basically, it's how to navigate perimenopause with confidence and ease. That's that I'm looking at the book right now. So um, there is a woman. Um, named her name is Shirley Weir, and she has this huge, thriving Facebook community called Menopause Chicks. And she and I met online, and she had been on my podcast, and um, we just really connected. And so she wrote this book, bringing together these experts, and she talks about building a healthcare team. And so I was really honored when she wanted to have a life coach be on a healthcare team. So it was just really cool, and just being able to share my own experience too and help other women through it too sometimes. So it's, it was really neat that she saw coaching as being just someone to have on your healthcare team. So that was just a neat experience to be able to write a chapter for that book. How fun. Yeah. I think that's amazing. I, and I, you know, I love that you bridge the gap and talk about what it has to do, how similar it is to going through puberty and Mm -hmm. how I, I have felt that I, okay. I I don't know if I've talked about this on another podcast episode, but it just made me think of when I was in middle school, Mm -hmm. I doubt they still have this anymore because this is very not okay anymore. (laughs) They might. So at our middle school, we had a period shower. (laughs) Oh yeah. I had one of those too. Yes. I forgot about that. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. That is so in a period shower and it was it was right. You would think oh. the period shower would be like in the back. Oh yeah, no, we put it up front. 
Ours was up front. Yes. It was like you walked into the locker room doors and walked oh. down about, you know, kind of turned a corner, obviously, so there was some privacy. And then it was about 20 feet of lockers. And then there was the, so the period tower was right across from the PE teacher's office. <laughs> And it was like total, it had like cement walls yeah. and it was an individual shower. And the the worst part about it from what my, if memory serves me right, is that it didn't have, it wasn't high enough to where, it was like a bathroom, like a short bathroom stall. <laughs> So, so anyone over five feet, so you could see you're gonna, you're gonna make eye contact with people. Oh, Nobody used it. Nobody used it. And there were just rumors. It'd be like, do you know that Liz was using the period <laughs> shower today? And and somebody no, saw it is blood running oh down. My so gosh. it was like incredibly shaming. Right, right. And and I remember just how embarrassing how mortifyingly embarrassing it was yeah. to talk about your period or to have a, you know, <laughs> a pad. I was wearing pads in middle mm-hmm. school or tampon and I didn't even know. So in eighth grade, we I went to church camp in the summer with my friend Alicia and of course, you know, swimming during summer mm-hmm. camp yeah. and I had my period and I had never worn a tampon before and she wore tampons and I didn't know how to wear them. Mm-hmm. So she, t- she gave me the tampon and she's like, you just go and you put it in your vagina. (laughs) I had never even seen my vagina or my vulva, I should say, with a mirror. So I'm in the stall and I was up too far. So I was essentially like in the area of my urethra and probably my clit trying to put the tampon in there. And it's not obviously not working and it just hurts. Yes. And I'm, I'm talking to her from, I can't believe I'm telling the story. I'm talking to her from this ba- inside the bathroom stall oh at church gosh. camp. And, and she's like, it should go in, like, especially if you're on your period. And I'm like, it's not working. And she's like, do you want me to come in and help? And I'm like, no, I was so embarrassed. Oh. So I ended up not swimming. Anyway, I say all that because I didn't, I was too embarrassed to ask my mom about these things. Like she wasn't, Mm -hmm. I never felt like she was making me feel ashamed, but she never really offered extra help. And quite honestly, if she had, I probably would have said no because I was (laughs) so embarrassed. And yeah, the period shower, (laughs) I say all that because like we're brought up to be embarrassed Mm -hmm. about it. Exactly. It's awful. So here's a funny thing is I like the period shower in my school because it was by itself. You could shower did by yourself. Yeah, I did. Oh, that's <laughs> because so I didn't, smart. I didn't like showering with other people. <laughs> so. Well, we didn't actually shower. Oh, I, yeah, you just like, splash we it would, on. And- <laughs> we would just like splash water. It's, and I doubt they do this anymore either. We would have to show oh, yeah. on the way out of the shower our PE teacher that we were wet. Mm-hmm. Same here. I had to go walk up with a towel wrapped around me to, and I had to have like water beads on me to show that I had right. <laughs> You can get around that very easily, but yeah, anyway. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm it's sure definitely. there's people listening who are like in their <laughs> 20s who are like, what? what the fuck kind of school is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm like, hey, this was your mother's generation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, I doubt they do. I wonder what they did. They probably use the period shower for like storage or maybe <laughs> they still use it. I don't know. Maybe. Depends on, maybe they depends on where it. it is. Yeah. So. And girls are just more empowered. Right. And, but that is an yeah. interesting point you brought up about talking to our mothers because I feel like, like, um, so my mom's had me when I was 19, right? But we still, like, there is never any conversation about hitting menopause or anything. So it's, you're kind of, I don't know, we get to this place where we're going through these ch- changes and, we don't really have any experience with it, which I, again, I love that there's more conversation now. There's books, there's groups, you know, there's even mm-hmm. podcasts that, and my podcasts for the longest time were um, talking to women in, in midlife. And so just, I, I love that we're having this awakening so that, and even people that are listening to this conversation, they're not going to be surprised when they turn 35 and or a little older and start realizing things are changing for them. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, I remember I heard this podcast by Andrea Owen. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These two experts. That's right. Talking about Here period showers. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's so funny. It, you know, I didn't learn about periods until school. Mm-hmm. At least I don't remember my mom ever talking about it. So I think it was fifth grade. And I still have the booklet. Oh, yeah. I found it several years ago in some box. It's so funny. It was like Playtex yeah. sponsored it. And it was like these girls dancing on the front of the cover. <laughs> Looking so and, happy. Um, 
I totally remember when I started my period. It was the summer before eighth grade. And I had gone to tennis lessons and come home and was just, oh. I was so upset. I was crying. And mm-hmm. yeah, I don't think my mom ever talked to me about it beforehand, but I've talked to my daughter. I talked to my daughter about it when she was nine. Yeah. Because girls are starting their exactly. periods so much younger. And I'm like, exactly. I have to because, yeah. yeah, she might be 10 and get it. I remember when I told her about it. The look on her face, she was like, <laughs> "What? That's weird." <laughs> yeah, it is. That's what she said. That's weird, and I'm like, "It is kind of weird." <laughs> it is. Let's be honest. Yeah, it is. Then she lost interest. Yeah. <laughs> well, you 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 started the conversation, and that's what's good, right? <laughs> it made me laugh. That was just her face. <laughs> she was. It was a combination of like disgust and bewilderment. <laughs> I I felt that way almost every month for as long as I had my period, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> And then weird. I remember <laughs> having the conversation with my mom. And the reason why I remember this, this I'm only 54. So um, we had belts to hold our pads on. <laughs> I heard about those. What the hell? What the hell? Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. When, so it was like, wasn't it sometime in the seventies that they made the adhesive pads? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was... I oh Liz, yeah. my condolences. Yeah, and I think what it was, and I remember. Yeah, I'd, I have to. I'd have to do the math right now, and, and so I'm not going to do that. You must head. have been just at the tail end. <laughs> I was going to say that I era. didn't have yeah. too long with that, but I do remember um, that they were that without the adhesive, they were a lot cheaper. So that was what we used for a lot because I didn't grow up with a lot of money. So. Was it metal? Like were the were the yeah. clamps metal? Yeah, it had or were they plastic? Like, I if I remember correctly, it was like metal. It reminds me of, of like the well, you know what? Like the pad had like really long tails. If I remember right, I don't know. It's funny. So it I came haven't all the way up like towards your belly. Yeah, button. I haven't even thought about that for a while. But it did have clips. But I just don't okay. remember. For some reason, what's coming into my mind is like garters, you know, to hold your yeah. stockings up. But I don't know if that's correct or not because I haven't thought about I'm gonna this, need to look this up. in a gazillion years. So I knew about that. You know, I knew about that from the book, Are You There, God? It's Me, Mark. Yes, of course. <laughs> she talked about that because yep. that book was written, I don't know, in the yep. 60s. And it was in our school library. And I remember that was kind of a taboo book mm-hmm. because they do the, we must, we must, we must, we must increase, increase our, our bust. Yeah. They, they did yeah. Okay, that. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're in elementary school. <laughs> exactly. And she talks about periods, right. which was super taboo. So that's how the only reason I knew about the belt. And I think I probably had a conversation with my mom about it, that mm-hmm. that's, that's what she used. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. I hadn't thought about that in forever. <laughs> And now look how far we've come I with know. the Diva Cup. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Things have come a long way. Well, let's, let's end on that <laughs> okay. note with the Diva Cup. That's right. <laughs> image <laughs> for people. Thank you so much for being here. I will also pop a link in the show notes to uh, your website and your Facebook group. I also will pop a link in there. Is the book still for sale? That one? Yeah. The Nokia book? Mokita, not Nokia. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you can get it on Amazon. So yes, it's still there. Okay, we'll pop a link in there. It's still there. And thank you everyone for listening to this uh, conversation, which kind of made some twists and turns. (laughs) And I hope that it was, if nothing else, entertaining. (laughs) For (laughs) sure. On the history of maxi pads. <laughs> I'm doing my bust increase exercises right now as we talk. So. Good. We'll keep us posted on how that goes. We'll, we'll expect some progression okay. photos before sure. and afters. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. Everyone out there, thank you for listening. You know how grateful I am for your time that you choose to spend it with me and my wonderful guests. And until next time, I will see you all out in cyberspace. Bye-bye.
I'd like to introduce you to the Minimalist Moms podcast. It's hard enough being a mom, and the last thing you need is stress from too much stuff and an overcrowded schedule. For too long, I lived with the mindset that bigger was better, and the more I added to my life, instead of feeling better, I felt overwhelmed. It was time for a radical new mindset. Less is more. I'm not into extremes. I didn't throw everything away. My brand of minimalism is more about adding than subtracting. Get rid of the excess to make room for what you love. In other words, it's about living life with purpose. I hope you'll listen in and my guest and myself can inspire you to think more and do with less. The Minimalist Moms Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts.